This session, we are going to discuss counseling groups. Uh, we are going to discuss what counseling groups are, how to fo do focus groups, where can we do groups, and who can attend those groups. Generally, counseling groups have a specific focus, such as educational, vocational, social, or personal. So you can use many aspects of the church. In educational, it can be a new believers focus group, helping someone learn how to maneuver through the Bible. You know, when we first have people who are saved, they're very excited. But because they don't know how to, to follow through with that, they lose their enthusiasm and sometimes return back to a lifestyle before accepting Christ. So we want to be sure that we understand the difference between educational and vocational. A vocational group could also be about their specific jobs. You know, what kind of stress are they going through? How to handle stress? Social. Social groups are such an important focus group where others can come with similar issues and start building relationships through, through Jesus and grow in their everyday life. They're able to handle everyday stress. They have someone else to call on other than the counselors or pastors or the deacons or the elders or just personal focus groups. That can be um, specific Bible studies. You know, many of the churches have women's Bible studies and so women go there. Other churches have focus groups for men Bible studies. So we wanna really be sure that you have a clear picture of what educational, vocational, social, and personal groups are. Group counseling tends to be growth oriented because it focuses on change. A lot of time people, when they go into a group, feel less threatened than when they're on a one-on-one -on -one with us counselors. And so it's a place for them if they wanna be quiet, they can just sit back and listen to someone else's experiences. And they still grow from that. And then at other times, it keeps them wanting to grow. And so they'll share more in a focus group than they would at a one-on-one. -on -one. And it keeps the focus off of them. So they don't feel like us as counselors are just staring at them, waiting and digging and probing and all the eight skills that y'all just learned about. The group relationship provides the empathy and support that helps create an atmosphere of trust that prompts one to share and to explore in order to bring about healthy biblical resolution. Again, I just want to repeat, it also gives them other people that they can call on when they're struggling. Maybe just to get some clarification about something that was said in the group. Um, what the homework assignment is, or are they struggling with their homework assignment? The participants are usually involved in some of the following aspects of life. I want you to just take a moment, and, and as I read this to you, I want you to think about a time in your life where you might have had a crisis of some type. Temporary conflict, you know, um, right now, a lot of people are without work. And so there are focus groups, um, I'll just give you one, uh, between job ministries. There's probably about 10 to 15 churches participating in those focus groups. And they're trying to provide a place for people to go and talk about their frustrations of not being hired. Or they might have, be in a job where they're not really allowed to bow their head at their desk and pray or to have things on their desk that remind them that uh, of their Lord and being able to uh, keep, keep him in their eyesight. Wanting to change self-defeating behaviors drugs, alcohol, anger, grief, eating disorders, self-image, cutting, and etc. These are very important aspects of life where they can go and attend a focus group to help them through it. Groups meet in places such as high schools, university counseling centers, mental health clinics, private counseling offices, faith-based Christian counseling centers, and church offices. Just take a moment to picture your church, how many empty rooms are not used during the week. You could have a focused group every night of the week, and especially adult groups when there are children's activities going on at the church. 
So really just think about how you could really utilize the church and those empty rooms that are there during the week. Special note, the group counselor and or facilitator will use verbal and nonverbal counseling skills as well as structured exercises. Skills the counselor will use are three main ones. Reflection, mirroring the verbal and nonverbal messages of the group. And that could be just using an example of Mary in one of the groups shared a very painful story but she could not look at the other group members while she was sharing this. So the counselor might, might really just give her a push up by saying, Mary, I noticed that it was very difficult for you in this sharing of your experiences to give any of us any eye contact. And we want you to know that that was okay. What, how great it is that you were able to share your experience with all of us. And that will help relieve some of her anxiety in sharing painful experiences. Plus, it will encourage others that they can share and they don't really have to look at anyone else in the group while they're sharing. However, as the group progresses, you will catch a lot of times that they want to give eye contact. They want to make that connection with whom sitting across the circle from them or next to them. Clarification helping the members understand more clearly what they are saying or feeling. Sometimes they're not able to get out what they're really trying to say, and we might have to ask for some clarifying questions to them. Interpretation, connecting present behaviors with past decisions. You know, it's like tying a shoe. We can all use shoestrings, but at the end of that shoestring, we're usually tying it all together. And so that's what these three counseling skills will do. It will tie it all together. A great resource to use is the model of life because it helps everybody keep the focus on themselves and to write out their own experiences, their own thoughts, and their own words. So use the model of life in some of your focus groups. The counselor's role basically is to, excuse me, to facilitate interactions among the members in order to help them. Learn from one another as each expresses him or herself. Clarify and establish personal goals. Embrace biblical-based concepts that involve taking godly action outside of the group. We always use biblical framework especially to focus on the here and now and to identi and identify present concerns. They are willing to explore from a biblical framework. A measure of trust must be established by the group members as well as the counselor and or facilitator in order for this to take place. We must stay biblically focused. Goal. The group has the responsibility to hold each person accountable to fulfill his or her stated goals for the week without condemnation. For the most part, the members decide the specific goals of the group experience. Some other goals for the group are to displace a level of trust that will allow open and honest communication, to find biblical ways of dealing with normal issues and conflicts with family, friends, co-workers, and even church relationships. This is so important. It can, your focus group can really show people how to imitate Christ and really grow into a wonderful brother-sister relationship that takes them through the rest of their life to where it'll have a domino effect. They'll be able to share with others through their own demonstration on how to communicate the appropriate way. You will be really amazed at how well people catch on and imitate each other. To become aware of one's choices and make wiser choices based on the Word of God. What better example do we have than the Bible itself? So to take each member through a certain scripture to where you'll watch their, like we said, verbal and nonverbal reactions to where they're 
you see these little aha moments, these lights on like, wow, I didn't realize that that's what the Word of God was saying. So helpful. And it provides hope. And some other goals are to make specific plans based on the Word of God and commit to following through on those specific plans. To learn more effective communication and social skills. We've already kind of covered that. To learn to confront others with honesty, care, and concern because you really do care. I, I have not ever met a counselor or facilitator who really was not there for the the Lord himself to really guide them and direct them but to really share some of their own experiences note this is not a selfish agenda to move away from expectations of others when not biblically based just kind of think about all the secular counselors that are out there and we just kind of put band-aids on people and we're not giving them the true help that they really are hungry for. To commit to live daily from a biblical framework by understanding one's identity in Christ and acting on Christian values. All right, let's talk about some of the advantages of groups. Group counseling has a number of advantages as a method of helping people make biblical change. Some of these advantages are to help people think biblically in order to change unhealthy attitudes concerning people, places, and things. A lot of times people have a lot of fear in, in making any kind of changes because then they feel like they're going to be alone. If they have to give up a place, a person, or a thing, it's going to cause a great anxiety in them. So being in a group can really help them give up some of those things that are not healthy for them to help people evaluate their beliefs about themselves and others from a biblical framework. Making biblical change is to help people learn about their style of communication. Questions. Do you use I messages or you messages? When you're trying to get your point across, are you going, well, you make me feel, or if you wouldn't, instead of saying, when I'm experiencing being uncomfortable, I really need to be able to get out what I need to say without being interrupted. There, you didn't ever say, you cut me off, you're always cutting me off, and so you were able to what I call holding the medicine ball and being able to hold on to your own thoughts and feelings and communicating because you do have rights to your thoughts and your feelings. You know, the Word of God says, it's okay to be angry, just sin not. Well, what does that really mean? Well, if you're in a group, we can help you explore that. Are you, the group members, still me-focused? Is it all about you? Are you trying to dominate the group? Well, if that's taking effect, then you might, as a facilitator, meet with that person afterwards and say, you know, I think that you're at a time in your growth where you could benefit more meeting with us one-on-one. -on -one. And that will help them make a biblical change. So when they're ready to go back into the group, they can go right back in. To help people learn more effective social skills. Remember, we've already talked about this, that when people come into group, they are bringing a lot of shame. They're bringing a lot of, uh, I don't have the right to my thoughts and my feelings, and why can't I get over this? So we want to give them an example of, how would God want me to act in my interactions with family? friends, and society at large. This could be very beneficial. And then you'll start noticing that even in their interaction in church, you'll see that they're communicating more with others. They're communicating better with their family. To be willing to accept good, honest observations by the group, honest feedback. Um, it's really up to the counselor facilitator to set the tone in these groups. And that means that from the get-go, you will have group rules that talk about how to give honest feedback. You'll give them a little short, brief lesson on the difference between positive encouragement versus what could be kind of considered negative. So we want to be sure that our group is educated on the proper way to address each other when we're sharing. Because remember again that 
these people that are coming to our focus groups are not necessarily healthy people and we need to help them. That's why the next, uh, one of the next goals is to help each person see the group as a microorganism of society, including the good, the bad, and the ugly. To help the participants through the eyes of a wide range of people, the group, see life differently from a biblical reference. Group counseling can meet the needs of very specific populations, such as children, adolescents, college students, and the elderly. Just think about being in your church service in all the different age groups. There can be a specific group for each age group. Each group has unique and specific needs, and the counselor and or facilitator must have some understanding as to how to facilitate these special populations. So you would need to, when you are interviewing for certain facilitators, you wouldn't necessarily put someone who is probably 80 years old with a group of teenagers. They might do a lot better with a much younger person that can really relate with them. So we have to be really careful of who we put in as facilitators as well. The counselor and or facilitator will notice those who need individual counseling from the group setting. The group counseling setting should provide any individual the opportunity, if they choose, to participate in private counseling. The counselor has a built-in counseling practice from the participants in the groups and makes a greater impact. It's not uncommon for one of the counselees in the group to ask the facilitator, can I meet with you one-on-one? -on -one? That's how we do build our caseloads. Group counseling for children often address some of these problems. Excessive fighting, inability to get along with peers, violent outbursts, chronic tiredness, lack of supervision at the home, neglected appearance, and tardiness. We also want to be sure that if we are going to facilitate these types of focus groups with children, we want to be able to have resources for parents as well. And so you might have a collective of maybe some people in the church who do aftercare uh, for school and um, might find some local community outreaches where parents can use that, utilize it, and be able to really have other options for their children, where they're with other peers that are kind of going through similar experiences. A small group setting can provide children with the above mentioned problems and many other issues. The opportunity to express their feelings about their problems and related issues. The small group provides a good place to identify children who are developing serious emotional and behavioral issues. And you will be able to, as a counselor facilitator, you'll be able to recognize this. Remember, if we can reach these children early in their life, there is a good chance of making changes that will positively impact the developmental tasks necessary to face life victoriously now and in the future. This is a great time, a good time, to introduce many of them for the first time to Jesus Christ.